Hi there, my name is Miss Townsend and I love math. Welcome to Math with Townsend. This video is for grade 9 academic students who are studying the measurement and geometry unit. It's part 3 of that unit where we look at optimization and this is video number 3 on optimization. Hopefully you've seen the other videos because you would have heard us define optimization from a mathematics point of view and do two explorations where we looked at trying to optimize rectangles. And this is what we discovered, that the optimized or optimal rectangle is in fact a square. So the best rectangle you can make ends up being a square. And I said this in the other video, yes, a square is a rectangle. It's just a special rectangle. So again, the optimal rectangle is a square. And more specifically, we discovered that we want to make, if we want to maximize the area and the perimeter is a known value, we make a square. If we want to minimize the perimeter and the area is a known value, we make a square. In general, whenever you see a word like maximize or minimize, you know that you are optimizing and you want a square. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is we're always talking about maximizing the area. So what about maximizing the perimeter? Well, maximizing the perimeter is not really a practical concept. As we saw in the other video, if I really wanted the biggest perimeter I could get, I would make a rectangle like this. Now, okay, fine. That looks way more like a snake than a rectangle. I get it. Let me draw it for you using my special drawing tools. There. Better? Happy now? Okay. If I wanted to maximize the perimeter, I would make the longest, skinniest rectangle I could. But again, practically speaking, there's no reason why you would want to maximize that. I mean, are you just running back and forth? Um, why do you what um, so we only maximize area same thing here we talk about minimizing perimeter so what about minimizing area well why would you minimize the area I mean why do you want to enclose the smallest area you can why don't you just not do anything and have an area of zero so again we only minimize perimeter so we maximize area and minimize perimeter and when we're dealing with rectangles both of those things mean make a square so the question is what if we're not optimizing a rectangle so what if we have a triangle and we're trying to maximize area given a certain perimeter or a parallelogram and we're trying to minimize perimeter given a fixed area and so on well Here's what the rule is. In a square, side lengths are equal. And that's kind of the rule you can extend to other objects. For two-dimensional objects, if you are optimizing, make side lengths equal. So we've already seen that for a rectangle, it's optimized when the side lengths are the same, and we call that a square. A parallelogram is also optimized when the side lengths are the same. And when you make the side lengths of a parallelogram all equal, you have something called a rhombus. And a rhombus is an optimized parallelogram. For a triangle, again, it's optimized when the side lengths are the same. And if you have the side lengths the same on a triangle, it's something called an equilateral triangle. So you'll notice the nice thing is that it's kind of one rule. Side lengths need to be the same. Now for a trapezoid, well, things are a little different because a trapezoid kind of varies, depends on what these angles are that we're talking about. And because of that, then we're not going to worry about any optimized trapezoids in grade 9. You'll have fun with those when you get to calculus one day, but not in grade 9. And what about a circle? Well, a circle is always optimized. It's the perfect shape. And if you want more information about a perfect circle, uh, check out Plato. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as Sheepy asks, hey, what about three-dimensional shapes? Obviously, the concept of optimization should make sense in the three-dimensional world, too. So instead of doing another exploration, we know the whole point why these videos exist is because we're running out of time in the school year. So let's just cut to the chase. If you want to maximize the volume of a rectangular prism, make a cube. If you want to minimize the surface area of a rectangular prism, make a cube. 
And doesn't that make sense after what we saw in two dimensions, right? That a two dimensional rectangle becomes a square when it's optimized. Well, a three dimensional rectangle becomes a cube when it's optimized. Makes sense. And here's kind of a summary of what we know. We know that for a rectangular prism, it's optimized when length, width, and height are all the same. And that's an object we call a cube. And this is probably my favorite cube in the universe. You know what that is. Now for a cylinder, we can optimize a cylinder. A cylinder is optimized when the diameter matches the height. Be careful here, it's not radius, it's diameter. So when the diameter matches the height, it's optimized. A sphere, well, a sphere is already perfect. There's no such thing as a sphere that's not optimized already. So what about these guys? Cone, square base pyramid, triangular prism. <clears throat> We're not going to optimize those in grade 9. Unfortunately, there's just a lot more going on here because of the angles and all that fun stuff. So we're not going to be worried about any optimization of the cone, pyramid, or prism, or triangular prism. So really, in three dimensions, we only have to worry about a rectangular prism, which becomes a cube, and a cylinder, which becomes this optimized cylinder with diameter matching height. Too bad there isn't a name for this. Hmm, perfect cylinder? We'll think of one, don't worry, we'll come up with one. So that's what you need to know. Let's look at some questions. How would you arrange 200 interlocking cubes into a square base prism so that it had the smallest surface area possible? Well, first of all, the word smallest should trigger an alarm in your brain. Smallest is like minimizing, and therefore this is a question of optimization. So we are trying to optimize something. And the thing that we're optimizing are tiny little cubes like this that fit together, that you know lock together and you can create all kinds of funky shapes, whatever, build forts for your He-Man or G.I. Joe or you know your Avengers dolls, whatever, I don't know. I'm not up on stuff like that. Anyway, optimizing with cubes, well, I'm not going to make a cylinder out of cubes. Obviously, I'm going to make something rectangular. And we know that if I'm optimizing something rectangular, then I want do, 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 to make a cube. So the 200 interlocking cubes are going to represent my volume. And let's pretend that they're centimeter cubes. So I have 200 little cubes do, 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 like this. And they're all going to fit together and make a perfect giant cube. The question is, what would the dimensions of this giant cube be? So what would the length, width, and height be? And it doesn't matter which one I call length, width, and height. If you're bothered by the fact that this is L, just turn your head or something. Um, <clears throat> so what do I do? If I know the volume is 200, how do I find the length, width, and height? Well, we, this is what we're going to do. So first of all, let me draw a little nicer for you. And I'll use my fancy drawing tools because I know you like them. Yes, I know you like them. And I know you like my sound effects. Right? You love them? OK, there's my beautiful cube. Oh, now that's lovely. Now that's a cube. Now. We have a length, width, and height. And because it's a cube, the length, width, and height are all equal. Let's call them x. So the length, width, and height all have to be the same, and we're going to call them x. So volume is equal to length times width times height, or in this case, x times x times x. Well, x times x times x is x cubed. Why did I put an L there? Ignore that. Volume is x cubed. So therefore, x cubed is equal to 200. So how do I find x? Well, here's something wonderful. You know that x squared can be undone by square root. Well, guess what? x cubed can be undone by cubed root. Wow. Some of you have that button on your calculator. It looks like this. It's a little three inside of what you think of a square root symbol. 
maybe it has an X here or a Y here. Now, if you don't have that button, you should have a button like this where you have a little Y and an X, or maybe a little X and a Y. And you have to tell the computer that this is supposed to be a little three if I'm finding cubed root. So let me kind of show you what you should do on your calculator. So I found some pictures of a couple different calculators just to give you an idea about what we're looking for. Again, you're looking to try to take what's called the third root of 200. Now, some calculators will actually have a button that just says third root. In which case, obviously, use that button. Now, most calculators, however, don't. So if we look at this sharp calculator, by the way, this is the calculator that I went to high school on and you still see me use it. The button right here says Y to the X. So this is your exponent button. And if you second function it, you'll get this button. And it says X root empty. And that's how you can take the third root of a number. Um, but this calculator here, so you can see this button here is your exponent button. And if you shift it behind it, and it's really tough to see, behind it you can see that there's your root button. And again, you have to tell the calculator it's the third root. On the calculator that comes with iPhones, for example, the button isn't a shift button, but shows up right here. And so they all have some sort of variation of x root y or y root x or something like that. If you find that button, you have to figure out in what order it works. So you either do 3 button 200 or 200 button 3. So hopefully you have your calculator and you can try it out. We're looking for an answer of 5.84. The cubed root of 200 is 5.84. So try your calculator, see if you can find that button. And again, it looks like for a lot of calculators that that button is the second function, <clears throat> excuse me, or shift behind your exponent button. So again, let's make sure what we've just discovered is that the cubed root of 200 is 5.84. And what that means is 5.84 times 5.84 times 5.84 is about 200. And you can check that that's right on your calculator, but obviously you're going to need to figure out where that button is that helps you take the cubed root. And if we go back to the original question that we were working on, that means that the dimensions of this cube should be 5.84 by 5.84 by 5.84. But again, the problem was that we had 200 interlocking cubes. Well, I'm not going to take some sort of cutting device and cut them up. So instead of 5.84 by 5.84 by 5.84, I'm going to try to make something that's pretty darn close to that. So for example, if I do oh, 5 times 5 times 8, that's 200. That's a volume of 200. <clears throat> Maybe I can do a little better. Maybe I can do... Hmm. Maybe I can do 6 times 6 times 5 and not use some of the cubes. Either way, the idea of that whole question is to try to build a shape as close to a cube as you can in order to reduce su surface area. So the most important thing that we just covered is actually a new button on your calculator. So I hope you're excited to have a new button that you know how to press. And by all means, I know everybody has their own calculator. Come and find someone in the math office if you want to learn how to use your calculator properly to do questions like this. It's again called taking the cubed root of a number. And it's important if you're doing optimization of a rectangular prism. Now, I know we only had time to do one question in this video, and I have more questions for you. So I'll make one more optimization video, and I'll see you there.